All right, so now we're going to cover sections 5 and 6 of chapter 21, continue our discussion of genomes and focusing here on chromosomes and alterations of chromosomes of various kinds. You can get a duplication of the chromosome number. You remember we talked in meiosis about this process called non-disjunction, where when the chromosomes are being moved around in the dividing the cell that's getting ready to divide of course you want uh, one copy of each chromosome going each direction well sometimes they don't separate correctly and so you can end up with gametes that have extra chromosomes in some cases even whole extra sets of chromosomes and this can result in the phenomenon of polyploidy in which an organism ends up with a complete extra set of chromosomes. In some case, one extra set, so they'd be triploid, or a couple extra sets, so they would be tetraploid. This is uh, quite common in plants. Uh, for example, um, blueberries, the type that we cultivate and eat for the most part, are tetraploid, while the wild blueberries are diploids. There's even a type of hexaploid blueberry. There's also hexaploid, the, the bread wheat that we eat is hexaploid. Strawberries, the cultivated strawberries for the most part are octoploids. And so you can see the ploidy level can get quite high in some of these types of organisms. Polyploidy is much more rare in animals, although it does exist. Now you can also get um, significant changes in particular chromosomes and as is shown here this is what has happened uh, between closely related species for example in humans and chimps our chromosome 2 has basically been broken into two separate chromosomes in um, chimps you'll remember that we have a diploid number of 46 chimps had of a diploid number of of 48 because again one of our chromosomes split in two when there was the divergence between us and chimps um, but you can see this part is essentially homologous to their chromosome 12 and this part is homologous with their chromosome 13 and a more distant relative of ours another mammal the mouse you can see parts of our chromosome 16 have been distributed to various chromosomes in the mouse, but those little parts would be quite, quite similar. All right. Now, um, you can also get duplication of particular genes uh, when, and this is a way it can happen with crossing over those homologous chromosomes and those chromatids. Ideally, you want equal sections to be switched between them, such that each chromatid ends up with the correct number of chromosomes, but sometimes crossing over does not result in an equal exchange. So you can see here, one of the chromatids has some extra parts, and this one is missing some things. And so this particular chromosome, a gene that is labeled as blue, where, of course, before each one of them had a copy, now one has two copies and one is missing a copy so this gene at least in this one allele or this one chromosome has been duplicated and if an individual inherits that they can end up inheriting an extra copy of that chromosome um, gene duplication has happened a fair amount in evolutionary history and a good example of this are the globin genes found in animals <clears throat> and so you can see in us in humans we have what we call the ancestral or the original globin gene and through time there's been duplications and then further duplications such that we now have what you would call a, a gene family the globin gene family and so the question is when this happens is it of benefit at all well, what can it lead to? Well, when you have your initial duplication, you've got now two copies of this one gene, 
and this is a Jane will assume was, was of importance and is needed. Well, when you've got the one copy, you've always got or when you one of those copies, as long as it stays the same pretty much, it can do its original job, if you will. But that essentially allows the second copy to have the potential to evolve or change a bit. And that's apparently what's happened in the globin gene, such that you now have this this increasing the number of these genes and then the genes begin to mutate and change over evolutionary time such that they begin to have slightly different jobs and some of these globin genes are expressed more so at earlier stages of life particularly in embry embryonic stages and then others after an individual is born and so um, the body makes use of them at different times so it basically increases the evolutionary potential of that species and so you can see we have the alphas on the left here and the betas on the right and so um, it's not surprising the alpha family those genes are all quite similar to each other and amongst the betas all those genes are quite similar to each other but when you make comparisons between them there is much less similarity between them because they have been evolving separately from each other for quite some time allowing there to be less similarity between the alphas and the betas of the globin genes now um, we talked earlier we talked about the processing uh, or the transcription and translation of genes of how you have um, within an, a eukaryotic gene you have introns and exons the exons are the part that parts that you keep and you put together in various arrangements to make um, RNAs and so through evolutionary time as well there has been shuffling or moving of exons between chromosomes between different genes um, <clears throat> such that um, now well here you've got these different genes with these different exons and um, sort of the original ones here but there's this relatively new gene that has basically acquired copies of different exons from these different genes and so now um, not only are you shuffling them within genes on the same chromosome but you can even through time shuffle, reshuffle them between different chromosomes creating completely new genes new combinations of exons the transposons we talked about previously they also play a role in gene duplication because as we said a transposon basically makes a copy of itself and then goes elsewhere in the genome well you can have these situations where you've got two transposons here and you've got this gene in between them and what can happen is the transposons can kind of work together you might say and you basically copy this whole stretch here and it can move somewhere else such that you then get this in this case which is a tetracycline resistance gene that is a new copy of it is made and it can spread elsewhere in the genome now this particularly is happening in uh, this example is in bacteria and it's a way in which a gene that's on the main chromosome <coughs> can then be copied and basically end up on a plasmid which then can move to another bacterium so it's a way for this gene to be copied and spread making use of these tetraposons in this case uh, these transposons in this case all right last section of this chapter and so the fact that genomes evolve allows us to make use of them to figure out the relationships between um, different types of organisms both on a sort of a large scale and a, and a smaller scale so when you look at the overall genome of eukaryotes they're more similar to the archaea this one group of prokaryotes than they are to bacteria and again on the small scale when we look at the genomes of these different mammals 
we see that chimpanzees and humans are quite similar and less so compared to a mouse. We're going to have a whole chapter where we talk about these family trees, what are known as phylogenies. But we see with this one how it shows essentially the time in the past at which we think these two species diverged and began evolving separately from each other. So humans and chip, chimps, the divergence is thought to have been about six million years ago. And you can see the split that gave rise to mice and then basically the line that gave rise to us it was about six and a, 65 million years ago, more or less. So clearly there would be a lot greater genetic difference between us and a mouse than there is between us and a chimpanzee. And another example that's given in the book is what's called the FOXP2 gene, a gene that's thought to be important, have been important in the development of the ability to speak. Um, and so all these organisms can make sounds and such. They can speak, if you will, but now, of course, we can speak in a much more complicated fashion. And so this gene has, it's thought to be an example of a gene that has been evolving quite quickly, relatively speaking, over time. And <clears throat> so here's some of our closest relatives, chimps, gorillas, orangutan, rhesus monkey, and then sort of this more outlier group, the mouse, which is not a primate like these others. And so you can see each little bar here, each notch, if you will, represents a single nucleotide change, whereas the gray bars represent amino acid change, which within this gene and the, 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 the protein that's made from it. Um, and so it just shows how this gene has evolved and allowed for differentiation of these different species. All right, other genes that are under significant evolutionary pressure, if you will, and also have been the result of significant gene duplication are these homeotic genes. These are ones that control development in animals um, as diverse as flies or mice or us. And so when you look at the fly, you see they have, there, there are, um, what, eight of these homeotic genes here, these ones that control development. And when we compare it to a mouse, you can see that within the mouse, there's been significant duplication of these genes and spreading of these genes to different chromosomes. You can see in particular with the green one, there's been a lot of duplication and spread of it. And again, giving these guys, the mouse, perhaps greater potential to evolve more significantly than say the fly and leading to a significant change in the form of this organism and the development of this organism. And this part of homeotic genes called homeobox is mentioned in the book. It's a sequence um, that's found throughout organisms and um, the slight variations that exist in between it have allowed for the changes that have occurred in these organisms and also would allow us to do, I'm sure you could create a family tree or a phylogeny based on this, this homeobox uh, portion of homeotic genes. Okay, that's chapter 21.